uh, introduce the speakers, uh, starting by, again, alphabetical order. Uh, so the first one is Georgios Agelopoulos, assistant professor at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Department of History and Archaeology. His research focus uh, includes the topics of political anthropology, nationalism and, and ethnicity, history of anthropological discourse in Greece and the Balkans, and the anthropology of migrants and refugees. He taught, uh, among the others, at the Cambridge University and the University uh, of Graz in Austria. Kitsa Kolbe is our second panelist, a Macedonian-born German-based writer, painter and translator. Uh, she is a philosopher by vocation. And she was teaching at the Institute of Philosophy in Skopje for more than a decade in the 70s and the 80s. In her writings, uh, uh, Kita deals with the various multifaceted aspects of the phenomena of exile at the Balkans, uh, and such as uh, in her re most recent novel uh, in English, I believe it's The Land of Refugees, uh, even though it was written in Macedonian. Uh, as well as uh, in her series of op-eds or, or columns uh, for the, the Macedonian platform of, of Deutsche Welle. Uh, Vyolca Krasnici is our third panelist. She's a sociologist, associate professor at the Faculty of Philosophy uh, at the University of Pristina, Kosovo. Her research interests are gender, nation, collective memory, transitional justice and human rights. And she has led and participated in numerous international research projects. While in 2016, she was a visiting research scholar and fellow at the Gender Research Institute at Dartmouth College. Her recent publications include Skirts and Words, The Art of Acknowledgement, Wartime Rape and Albanian Nationhood in Kosovo, co-authored with uh, Ivor Sokolic and Denisa Kostovitsova, 2020, and Domestic Violence, uh, Gendered State Rationality and Women's Activism in Kosovo, published in 2019. Our fourth uh, speaker is uh, Olsi Lelai, who is the head of the Department of Ethnology at the Institute of Culter Cultural Anthropology and Art Studies in Tirana, Albania. He is research researching the knowledge production on the communist past in Albania, the history of Albanian ethnology, as well as the urban planning and social movements in the country, but also beyond. Chavdar Marinov uh, is our fifth a uh, speaker, a Bulgarian historian affiliated with the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, Chavdar has an, uh, an extensive re research experience on Macedonian history and memory politics, among the others. Uh, this is the aspect which he is well known here, at least uh, in Macedonia. And his in-depth analysis of the Macedonian question in the post-Second World War period was published in Macedonia in 2013, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, based on his PhD thesis defended in France. He, but he was also part of the book project Entangled Histories of the Balkans, which resulted in a four volumes uh, of transnational history in the region, a pretty uh, relevant book for our discussion, I would say. Dubrav Kastanovic is our final speaker, a Serbian historian and professor at the University of Belgrade, Belgrade uh, at the Faculty of Philosophy. Her research focus includes, among the others, the topics of the various issues of democracy in Serbia and the Balkans in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries, interpretations of history, new Serbian textbooks, social history, the process of modernization, history of women in Serbia, but also most recently transnational history, which she published in a formal book. So practically without further ado, I will just briefly kind of refer to what was uh, spoken yesterday and somehow try to link this as some sort of a framework with uh, the first question which we already prepared for our panelists. Uh, so practically yesterday, as I already mentioned, we had a fruitful discussion with um, prominent Polish, German, French and American experts who mused upon the various theoretical notions of transnational, national histories and historiographies, and also provided some sort of uh, illustrations for their points. One of the key take takeaways of the discussion was the consensus practically on the dichotomy between the transnational approach towards history and memory uh, and the nation-centered historiographies as two separate but also legitimate domains of historical research and memory politics. Uh, what was stressed as a separate entity though, was the so-called so -called legitimation seeking value-based nationalistic as opposed to national historiography, uh, also referred to yesterday as weaponizing history, a model of weaponizing history, which also is very much 
linked to the identity building processes in the region and beyond. Uh, so practically my first question to all the panelists would uh, be built upon this, this framework, which we discussed yesterday. And I would kindly ask to uh, refer and map practically this tension between the nationalistic turn on one hand and the transnational turn on the other in the domestic context context uh, of yours. Uh, and I would also like to, as a sub question, ask you uh, whether you are able to point out the major agencies and actors uh, which are relevant and, and acting in this regard. So, George, over to you, and I will signal you when. When, yes. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation and um, uh, thanks to the organizers for taking the initiative to. Uh, organize these panels. Um, let me start by clarifying a number of points. First, I'm not a historian, as uh, it has already been explained. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, uh, and therefore I perceive uh, history as an ongoing uh, social, cultural, and political process. Um, secondly, my approach today will be Greek-centered, uh, and this is uh, intentionally uh, organized in order to highlight the very recent developments in uh, the public history discourse in Greece. Um, I'm arguing that um, in the last five or six years, this discourse is undergoing uh, significant changes. Um, so, and obviously, um, the uh, points you already raised about the, uh, about the historical discourse as used um, in a kind of weapon um, is very relevant to my uh, approach. Um, when you organized this uh, panel, uh, you provided us with a number of questions three questions and I will try to address the first question. Um, I would say it's always, it's almost impossible to address the first question without discussing the two other questions, but I will try to do my best. Um, the first question you raised had to do with what is happening regarding the nation center historical domains and how they regain uh, relevance in the public discourse. Um, this seems paradoxical, but if we perceive it as paradoxical, uh, basically we imply that people capitalize upon the experience of the past. This is something which is rather debatable, I would say. Um, so given that history is an ongoing process, the key idea in order to understand the nation-centered historical domains, at least in Greece, is the crisis, the social economic crisis, and the refugee movement. The recent social economic crisis provided the ground for perceptions claiming the failure of democracy, claiming the failure of European integration, and the need of stronger national policies, and obviously stronger national narrations, and history is beyond any doubt, uh, let's say the most dominant um, of such uh, uh, national narrations. When I'm talking about the recent socioeconomic crisis, I'm talking about what we experienced in Greece since, 19, um, since 2010, in the last decade. The PRESPA agreement and the refugee movements are the two key moments where this nation-centered historical domain managed to become dominant in the public discourse. So um, what I'm saying here is, uh, this domain is not due to um, the press agreement and the refugee movements. Um, the refugee movement and the nationalist reaction to the refugees and the nationalist reaction to the press agreement are just some uh, the key points where this uh, appeared in the public domain. Of course, beyond all these contexts uh, lies a division between the left and the right um, in Greece, the left and the right wing um, understanding of politics and understanding of history in Greece. The left attempted but certainly failed 
to provide a discourse, um, uh, an alternative discourse, and the right wing, especially the ultra right wing, managed to uh, impose a, a very hardline um, nationalist understanding about what is happening these days in Greece and how we can explain what is happening on the basis of our history. So it's it's a domain which has the a present as a starting point and um, somehow um, imposes an understanding of the past. And I, I need to make a parenthesis here. Overcoming the crisis, the social economic crisis, or overcoming the refugee crisis, uh, obviously does not automatically imply that we will overcome such nation-centered historical domains. But let me uh, come back to the point and uh, we'll briefly explain what is happening. Uh, there was a, 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 a tremendous attempt in the public media by professional historians or I would say non-professional, non-academic scholars who write uh, about the past. I'm not trying to make a distinction between writing um, the past and history. This is a, a false distinction, but anyway, um, let's keep it as such. So there has been a tremendous attempt to um, explain the crisis and to explain the social economic crisis and to explain the presence of the refugees as a threat to the Greek nation. So the, the overall uh, context is a context of fear and threats. On the north, the Macedonians are claiming our lands. On um, the west, northwest, the Albanians are claiming our lands. On the east, the Turks are claiming our lands. And on the top of that, uh, the refugees are everywhere. The refugees are to um, are becoming the internal enemy uh, of uh, the nation. Um, I don't want to expand on that. I'm sure we all understand this uh, discourse, uh, but certainly this discourse managed to become dominant beyond any doubt. It isn't dominant in the academic uh, in the academic discourse, but it's dominant in the public discourse. It's dominant in the media, uh, and it will certainly um, influence the academic writing of history in Greece uh, in the uh, coming years. Thank you. Thanks, Georgios. Just a brief uh, clarification. Practically, I, I tried to reframe the question, uh, having in mind that yesterday. Uh, yesterday's discussion and somehow set up the framework, but please feel free to assist all the panelists uh, to address the question which was already already mentioned in the in the, our correspondence. So that's all from my side. Kita, over to you. Please unmute yourself. Yes. He'd say if you, if you can just unmute your microphone. Yes. You can hear me now? Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I am um, living in Germany since uh, 40 years, but I, as a novelist and philosopher, I have um, great interest in um, topics and issues. They are uh, linked with uh, um, Balkan history, um, particularly with um, um, themes like trauma, refugee, and reconciliations. Of course, um, my interest is um, in the first line, um, the cultural the memory in um, the context of Balkan countries. Uh, my first encounter with um, cultural memory was in Germany, and um, it is very, very interesting for our uh, panel to stress uh, one experience, how I came uh, to one um, solution to um, um, 
to analyze and represent um, some stories of uh, uh, refugees um, from the Greek uh, civil uh, war um, they, that uh, are living in um, uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia now. And um, in Yugoslavia, I was studying philosophy and uh, I made my um, MA, uh, Magister Artium, about um, uh, aesthetics of Theodor Adorno. And I was interested in um, Frankfurter School or um, uh, critical theory. And um, already in Yugoslavia, I found in um, this uh, kind of philosophy, which um, uh, treated uh, themes and issues from the Jewish philosophy and the uh, immigration of Jew Jews philosophers in, in America in the time of um, the Nazi um, regime in Germany was um, one um, um, important uh, reason for me to, um, to point out in my uh, philosophy um, these problems which in uh, Yugoslavia were in the 50s um, on the second not in the first position nobody um, spoke of, uh, in, in this time in the 80s about um, refugee trauma or about reconciliation. Uh, I, I know that um, there was um, text uh, books commission from Yugoslavia and uh, of commission, joint commission of Yugoslavian historians and Italian historians, but uh, in the public dispute, there was uh, no um, uh, significant uh, dis uh, discourse, significant discussion about trauma and refugees. Uh, but because uh, my biography is um, um, in one uh, very, um, um, very deep connection with, with this um, problematic, because I was born three years after my my parents, the families of my both parents fled from, from uh, Greece. Um, of course, I was searching uh, now, uh, after parady paradigm uh, for these uh, investigations. And um, my uh, first interest and in my, um, um, in, in, in the uh, current situation in, uh, on the Balkans and, uh, North Macedonia um, is um, the problem of um, reconciliation between uh, between countries, uh, neighbor countries of Macedonia. The Balkans is uh, a region in which uh, where happened so many uh, wars, and there the last uh, wars are happened for twenty uh, years, but. Uh, the processes of, uh, of overcoming the trauma of wars, new borders and um, uh, ethnic cleansing were always um, tabooing and, um, and forgotten. Uh, I am not, um, I'm not sure that in, in, um, in the Balkan region there is understanding and uh, uh, the, that the problem uh, of the, the problem of the uh, ongoing wars or the repeating of wars in, in, in the Balkan uh, could be solved from, uh, in the, after the model of um, uh, reconciliation and um, friendship. Uh, uh, friendship um, processes between the uh, European countries such Germany and France or Germany and Poland. And um, I remember in the uh, um, interdisciplinary uh, commission uh, between Greece and Macedonian, and I think um, uh, the, the new uh, 
movement, the new nationalism in EU and in some uh, former uh, Soviet bloc uh, countries uh, we, um, could be a difficult uh, a gr a difficulty to to start and to prolong these processes uh, after PRESPA agreement or after a, a, a agreement between Macedonia, North Macedonia and Bulgaria. Uh, there are um, differences in the new nationalism uh, in uh, EU countries and uh, countries in the Balkan, West Balkan and the countries in uh, former uh, um, in Eastern Europe, former uh, Soviet blocs countries like Visegrad Group. Uh, in the first question, um, we are asking uh, about what we are thinking about um, the turn to nation-centered historical domains. Uh, in my, from my perspective, the socialistic uh, narratives were always um, uh, nation-centered. Uh, uh, the uh, the only one uh, uh, the, the problem or, or the issue which was um, not allowed was self um, self uh, uh, definition of uh, national states. Uh, in, this was in Yugoslavia, uh, and, and there was uh, the same situation in the Soviet bloc. Uh, it seems to me that all these countries uh, in, the, uh, in, in the historical turn of um, uh, 1989 um, saw in the freedom the possibility to, um, to build uh, nation states and the possibility to build uh, nation uh, narratives. They are uh, in, uh, in in these nation narratives where in in uh, the socialistic period dominant um, characteristics they are um, typical for monolithic, monological, and exclusive narratives. Uh, all the social socialistic nar uh, national narratives were patriotic. Um, uh, the the main point was was proud. There, there was sacralization of liberation war. There was um, one ritualized uh, memorizing of the war. And um, uh, there was um, an opposite of a cultural um, memory, uh, like we uh, know now in the uh, last two decades in, in Europe, because um, um, cultural memory was um, shaped um, mythology and myth of the of the country or uh, nation or ethnic groups. Um, I, in my opinion, in the um, in the last th three decades of so-called transition, the narrative in in these countries were not less not nationalistic but more uh, nation-centered and nationalistic. This is one, one aspect in this very difficult and complex situation in Europe with a, a turn to new uh, nationalism because the phenomenon of uh, national, new nationalism in the old member countries in Europe and the newer uh, member countries like Visegrad Group or uh, nationalism in the countries, they are still not uh, members, but they are uh, waiting to uh, um, begin uh, negotiation uh, with EU, are very different. Uh, there is another situation in the region of uh, the countries of former Yugoslavia, and um, the, the, the uh, second situation typical for the Visegrad group and the situation in the um, um, old members of the EU. In this, I can say some uh, briefly, brief uh, uh, notes to the situation in, in Germany. Um, there is um, in Germany now one dispute 
about the reimagining or the return of the of the nation. Of course, um, um, known uh, scholars uh, um, stressed and discovered that, that uh, uh, although the modernization theory uh, had um, uh, considered the nation as one transition stage uh, in the evolution of in the global world uh, of the nation to one uh, new units or to global society um, the current situation shows that this modernization theory um, but also the um, uh, memory studies uh, left uh, like um, Alida Asman says the container of nation empty the left left lefties and the liberal democrats they um, treated nationalism as a negative phenomenon uh, which has to be overcome they have forgotten that we all live in in nation states and the nation states uh, are not going to disappear in eu or in the uh, over the world in in this um, concrete uh, moment so um, they are uh, they are now um, in the uh, public uh, dispute in germany some uh, interesting um, uh, discussions how uh, the liberal democracy can challenge this um, uh, new uh, nationalism uh, one um, one uh, one model offers alida asman uh, she uh, tried to remember that um, the nation uh, itself is not a negative phenomenon that we are living all of us in nations but the framework in which the nation national narratives and the nation is articulated there is uh, this means um, in an uh, the the problem can uh, the problem of the national uh, nationalistic um, narratives and nationalistic movements um, can can be uh, resolved not uh, with much more uh, democracy and um, democracy uh, which is inclusive for uh, for example uh, migrants one another um, one another model uh, if, um, offers um, one young historian Jan Plamper in his book um, Das Neue Wir, The New uh, We Are, and he um, proposed to, um, uh, to make a, no, a new paradigm about what is German. Uh, to Germany, to be German was still uh, nowadays was uh, uh, ethnobiologic, biologic uh, defined. And he is, um, his idea or his proposal is that um, the new groups of uh, the, the, the former Vertriebene, um, um, these are refugees uh, after second uh, um, war, war, world war, um, uh, from uh, Poland, uh, Silesian, and uh, the the, uh, the so-called Gastarbeiter, the foreign arbeiter, uh, foreign uh, workers from uh, uh, several um, parts of um, on Europe, and uh, the, uh, the Jewish contingent, Juden uh, from uh, Soviet Union, the Soviet uh, Deutschen, the Soviet uh, Germans, and the new uh, migrants. Uh, could uh, be uh, integrated if Germany could create a new paradigm of integration, of belonging to the German uh, community, to the German uh, society, uh, like a salad bowl. In this salad bowl, 
everybody um, remain, uh, remains in uh, his own identity, but he, um, he has um, plus the uh, German identity. And because of this, these citizens of, of Germany uh, are called plus Deutsche, plus Germans. It is very interesting uh, model to think, um, um, to find a way from this um, uh, claustrophobic, um, one, one second, one second, claustrophobic um, um, build, picture of narratives on the Balkans. So this was my first statement. Thanks, Kitsa. So yes, we are reaching out, as you can see, the question of new nation nationalisms. Uh, and thanks, Kitsa, again, for this uh, comprehensive map and also including the German case, uh, which is not very actually, uh, uh, not very present in, in these debates. Uh, but yes, we are looking forward to, the, to, the, to your sec second opportunity to speak further on uh, at the discussion. So, Yolta, right now, over to you. Yes, sir. Uh so thank you and all the organizers for uh, making me part of this wonderful panel and also taking having this opportunity to engage with really, really uh, important and challenging uh, questions from the point of knowledge production but also of the uh, memory uh, uh, memory activism so i would like to i would like to perhaps uh, make the standpoint uh, from which to start thinking about offering some of my understanding and also some of my opinions on the question, first question that you have raised, uh, that you place the, um, the European integration as the larger frame and also how the nation-centered historical domains are gaining relevance in the public, uh, public discourse. I think to to position the, um, or to begin to think about this question and possible so, uh, answers to it is to perhaps start first thinking about how we understand history. Second is also how to, to understand how history is used, how it, it works, and also how history is uh, revealed in specific narratives and memorialization, uh, memorialization practices. And I think throughout my research in, on collective memory, symbolic nation building uh, related to Kosovo, but also wider to the social the Southeast Europe, the importance in, in the research, in, especially in my take, has been on to look at the ways history and historical reasoning are uh, integrated into different memorialization uh, practices. So second, I think that it's important when we, uh, to, while attempting to, uh, to provide, to offer some questions, is to look also at power and, and to see how power is constitutive of history. So it's not history that something it's as a social, history is primarily a social, social process, but also to look at how power works together with history, because we cannot have a power, a power uh, analysis, power analysis and, and one side uh, analysis of historical discourses and how different historical discourses materialize, but also to look at the intersections between the power and history. So how power works and also how history, uh, history works. And I think the, this brings us to more contextual analysis and that it, it opens up the opportunity to look at the processes of uh, uh, conditions of production of historical narratives. What are those conditions that produce certain historical narratives that, that become uh, dominant? And also how these different conditioning, social conditioning renders other um, the historical narratives less important, less invisible, less visible, and also pushes them at the at the margins. There are countless studies, countless, countless uh, numerous um, arguments by, for example, gender theorists that uh, brought into discussion the neglect of gender as an analytical historical category, but also the the uh, the marginalization of women's women's uh, voices and women's activism in his historical historical processes. I think. Um, so what happens in the context of the European integrations when we look at the region, not only Kosovo, but also the wider Southeastern Europe, I think the European, European integration is a, is, a powerful, is a powerful frame. 
and it's also a strategic orientation of the of the societies, not only of the political establishments and political elites, but also uh, societies that are aspiring uh, modernized and European way of uh, way of life. But in no way, European integration is going to to um, uh, undermine the, the relevance of national identity and also nation as a dominant frame of uh, of, uh, of identification. So, uh, but apart from this, so while this nationalism that we are witnessing right now may be forward looking, so that and European integrations may be may be defined as one aspect of this reworking of the nationalism that presses um, or looks forward and tries to forget the past and to look uh, to look at least rhetorically to su suppress the past. However, the the past continues to be dominant also within this new ways of how the nations imagine. Uh, themselves and also how nation states are, are developing it structurally, but also about, about, uh, but also symbolically. So then the question is also how you know to look at the past. So can we look at the present and the future without looking at the past? And I would say that no, because the past is so formative, and the past is uh, guides the uh, the the present and and. Um, um, despite uh, even today because of the pandemic and the, the risks and the trying times of the COVID-19, uh, the past still remains dominant and also one of the tropes that provides how, how collectives and how societies are imagining, imagining its, uh, itself. So to look more conceptually and maybe methodologically is to also to, you know, to look at the past as, as formative, of the present, uh, not as something that is static as frozen, but also how it transforms and how it takes different shapes in the presence, in the political discourse, in practices of, um, of com uh, com uh, memorialization, but also how it is, uh, it's din dynamic aspects and formative of sociality, identity, and collective, uh, collective memory. Because despite having this forward-looking nationalism and also looking at the European integration as a frame uh, in the future, I think the national identity still remains the, the primary identification uh, uh, for many uh, in, in groups, social groups, and also uh, nation states in the, in the, in the region. So, in, and thus, uh, so while the, the future is, is yet to come, but the past maintains a living relation to the present and it is entangled in social structures that are molded in political discourse, cultural memory, policy, but also uh, commemoration, uh, commemoration um, uh, practices. I think uh, I find this first question a bit uh, um, challenging because to me, I would, uh, what I, through my research, especially the research in Kosovo, I've seen that also, when we speak about uh, nation, nation, nation states, or, or the nation, so somehow the nation and the memory stand, or they have stood actually, and they continue to, to stand as indivisible and intertwined to uh, and intertwined even to this day. So, and also memory and the past, this living past, and especially the recent past, and here uh, in terms of the Kosovo context, uh, the 1998-1999 war, is the recent as a recent uh, um, history uh, recent recent past is the um, it's formative of the national of the nation state but also of the national national uh, identities and so with this to see how and I think also this can uh, be extended to other uh, societies in, in the countries in southeastern Europe that it's also every nation has accounts on this. Uh, given national temporality, uh, but the nation has remained the dominant, the dominant frame. Yes, maybe the nation uh, and, and, and the interpretations of the nation can be are are different, are uh, plural, but also nationalist national nationalism as a, as an ideology is also uh, uh, as a dominant frame can um, uh, remains dominant in how um, how societies are are building a shared understanding of the of the past but unfortunately we have also witnessed that um, uh, 
for example, through memorialization uh, practices, this had served more to, to forge an exclusivist national, national uh, identity. So that the, it's not only exclusion, exclusionary, but also hierarchical categorization of the past events and the actors, and moreover, on thus how the nation is imagined, who is within the we uh, imagined community and who uh, in opposition to the to the other. So this is this is um, uh, the risk. So definitely, the question is that uh, how to to undo uh, this. A point of imagination of the nation that builds, that is uh, uh, built and constructed through this um, exclusionary and hierarchical uh, hierarchical uh, categorization, and to, this brings to the second point when I mentioned about power, that also to look at how po power constructs this relationship between memory, places, actors, and uh, and practices, and to look uh, to uh, I think to to map and also to to offer alternative uh, alternative narratives and voices to and to first to problematize what the uh, the, uh, the selective selectivity of the past and also to to bring to uh, different voices uh, into the public uh, into the public domain so if the nation and the if the nation and the national ideologies do dominant are defined through uh, exclusivity and through belonging of a one sp specific particular group and the exclusion of other other groups. I think this will uh, this will even within this larger frame of the European integration. Maybe you know the rhetoric of inclusivity. If it is there, it will, it will not mean de facto inclusive and democratic uh, opening of the social processes that will bring into uh, to feed or to, to construct narratives that are uh, uh, in solidarity that, and also that uh, acknowledges diverse knowledges, experiences and, uh, and voices. So, the, and also what are the silences and who are the social groups that are excluded from that, uh, from that uh, uh, process? So uh, yes, uh, I think uh, one way uh, to look at this is to undo uh, exclusivist, nationalist, and national national frames, uh, and this can be a first step also be, and to lead to social social change. Because not um, if you look at this in a very static and very uh, exclusionary, uh, in one one sided way, I think um, uh, it's the the present cannot be constructed if there is no agreement on the shared past. What the shared past constitutes, and to, in order to build to build a shared a shared understanding of the past, there is a need to for a democratic and inclusive uh, process of diverse histories, memories, and sentiments. Because we have heard from also from the previous speakers how important is the politics of uh, of emotions, uh, rather being emotions such as fear in Greece or emotions uh, also in, in um, um, of sol and calls for sol solidarity, for example, in Germany with the refugees that are very important in this uh, process or in this social process and looking at history as one process that not only historians take a center, a center stage, but different actors and different gr social groups are also uh, participants in the historical, in making of the and production of, uh, of histories that goes beyond the confines of nationalist communities, which is an exclusivist and uh, exclusionary, uh, through exclusionary practices. So I will, I will stop here. Thanks, we all say yes, and you have uh, the privilege to, to have the first question. You can see it in the chat box. I believe this is also very much overlapping uh, the second question of the of the panel discussion itself. Uh, so yes, you will have uh, your time to to address the, the question properly in in the in the next section. Right now, without further ado, I'm just turning over to Olsi. So Olsi, the floor, floor is yours. Thank you for for inviting me to be part of this panel. And uh, honestly, uh, I'm not an historian, and I, I, I need to underline this, but uh, my work uh, has been dealing with uh, Al the history of Albanian ethnology during communism. And as such, uh, I, I have been dealing with the way how, under certain circumstances, certain narratives of a nation have been built. 
and uh, in what way uh, ethnology participated in narrating oneself so to to the wider public and society. So uh, within this idea uh, and framework of work of mine, uh, the relationship between uh, history and ideology has been very much uh, present in working, especially in seeing in the way how a nation is narrated to, 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 to the people. And um, a number of questions coming to the issue, uh, we, we are together talking are already already discussed uh, and to me the question of power as you also brought it up is very very much important especially in the way how history is being framed uh, and under certain under the, the current circumstances the relationship between the present and the past and future are uh, the three key points upon which uh, history and the idea of a nation is being uh, articulated uh, as such uh, uh, to me uh, um, history is very much presentist rather than a, 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 a why is very presentist because uh, all the narratives that uh, albanian public at least right now is is faced is related precisely to the, the ongoing crisis that uh, not only albania but uh, european society and probably world society is going on like uh, the world crisis uh, that uh, uh, the pre previous speaker brought it up ha has uh, in a way or another has influenced uh, uh, the bringing up of a certain narrative of nationalism into the public uh, taking uh, the, the albanian case as an example and here when i'm talking about the albanian case i'm i'm referring and eventually uh, we also will expand later on like to 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 to, to, to albania uh, within the the country of Albania. So, in, in this sense, uh, the, the idea of, one, of oneself, the, the crisis uh, after the fall of communism, brought to to to, to seeing uh, a, a, a historical self being uh, dismantled in front uh, due to to the lack of economic perspective and to uh, to, to 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 the lack of perspectivism uh, brought to, to a, a wider sense of uh, of migration so a uh, lots of narratives uh, that uh, were built on on oneself started to be uh, questions by people themselves and um, parallel to this sense of history uh, as pa as time started to, to to continue and to go and people started to to grow up uh, uh, economically uh, the diaspora started to bring new fluxes uh, of ideas about how history should be viewed on one hand not only the intellectual di diaspora but also the uh, the everyday people that started to economically and one flux uh, upon which the the concept of uh, of, a, of nation is being articulated public is from the diaspora. The diaspora groups are very much influencing or bringing ideas about how a, a, a nation should be narrated. Internal processes within the Albanian academia started to face the, this idea between history and, and, and ideology precisely within the, the prism of, 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 of uh, uh, how the state contributed into, into creating an idea of oneself within the frame of nationalism. But uh, mind you, within this context, uh, what I'm seeing is that very much the history that is being produced uh, within the Albanian context is very much re re uh, uh, relational. So it's uh, it, in a way it it mirrors a, a, a different discourse against the uh, alternative uh, discourse of oneself that the other nations are producing. So basically, what uh, the Greek media is or the Greek uh, historians are talking about uh, the relationships between Greeks and Albanians or the Serbian and Albanians or Macedonians and Albanians, in a way or another, reflects uh, the way how uh, the, the nation is articulated within the context of Albania. In this sense, what I'm saying is that uh, the European perspective seemed uh, into uh, the wider public as a as a way to overcome it but uh, the current crisis that europe is facing is bringing back a number of discourses uh, 
because uh, Europe was seen as, a, and is still seen, and which is very good, a, 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 as a target which we should reach. And within this context, uh, things will change. But uh, the way how Europe is being uh, questioned um, due to its internal problems uh, is facing uh, our countries and Albania on the other hand uh, with the problem of uh, uh, whether uh, a nationalistic discourse or a nation-centered discourse should eventually be questioned as much as a narrative. On the other hand, the, this is a parallel line that goes on with this uh, uh, context. Another parallel line that goes uh, along is a question of justice, history and justice. Uh, a, a number of discourses within the Albanian public are reflected precisely on the logic of justice and injustice and why history is there, like why we need a, a certain history. And precisely the question of justice becomes very important, especially in the way how everyday people, everyday Albanians are relating in reading history. Most of uh, uh, nation-based narratives re uh, are related to questions of injustice and the way how a nation is created over time. Here, the questions of power are very much uh, important because uh, uh, the very notion of justice that uh, these narrations mirror are, are, are based precisely in the, on, the very, on the very concept that the other has been very much injustice. But on the other hand, even the discourse of the other on oneself precisely mirrors the question of justice and injustice. So this is another issue upon which uh, centered based, uh, uh, nation based uh, narratives are, are articulated. So the question of power, the question of uh, 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 crisis, economic crisis, so, uh, social crisis, the pandemic, uh, the question of justice, the experience of everyday uh, Albanian in Albania and outside Albania are becoming fluxes upon which uh, 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 actors be, uh, beyond the professional historian, but uh, uh, civil society, uh, uh, passionate individuals within history are participating in creating a, a, a very much pluralistic on one hand, as it looks, but a very much a center based history in, in the public discourse. On the other hand, an, another issue coming is the relationship not to the distant past when the nation was created, but also to a very near past, which is the history between uh, uh, the Albanian history during communism. And this is another issue which the Albanian public is faced. So what was communism for Albanian? And this, uh, the, the logic of nas nation is being articulated also within this relation. So with this, uh, within this context, uh, these are the contexts upon which uh, the, 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 the public is debating uh, what is nation on one hand, but, uh, uh, and also what, uh, and what is the position of everyday Albanian within it. So I'll, I'll leave it here for the moment and pick it up within the other uh, questions that we have ahead. This is a kind of the panorama that, uh, the, uh, that we are facing in Albania. Uh, Thanks, uh, Olsi. Thank you very much. Uh, Chapter over, over to you. Uh, thank you, Naum. Uh, I hope that you can hear me now. Uh, so, uh, well, let me first uh, thank uh, the Forum Civilia Friedensdienst for giving us the opportunity to see us uh, this, this evening. It is really uh, a pleasure uh, to meet all of you online. Uh, so, uh, my talk is going to be, <laughs> unfortunately, it is going to be against, uh, again, um, nation-centric, uh, namely Bulgarian-centric in my case. Uh, uh, but uh, in my opinion, many, uh, many aspects uh, could apply, many of the things that I'm going to, to stress uh, can apply to other cases, in particular uh, the one of uh, Romania, 
and uh, of course the one of Albania, uh, which has was just presented by Professor Lelai. Um, so um, the first, uh, there are indeed the um, well when we are uh, we address the question of the reasons of this popularity of um, the nationalist uh, discourses, uh, narratives, um, symbolism, and so on in the public space. There are of course plenty of um, aspects that uh, should be uh, should be analyzed and uh, could be. Uh, and uh, should uh, should be uh, presented, and uh, the first one uh, is certainly uh, the sad heritage of the state socialism in uh, in Bulgaria, or uh, uh, which was uh, uh, also evoked by uh, Professor Lela in the case of Albania. I I will not uh, I wouldn't like to emphasize this point too much, but uh, we should take into account that in uh, countries like Bulgaria and Romania, the former regime so the regime before 1989 was quite nationalist especially in its last decade so in bulgaria practically it ended up with the renaming with bulgarian names of uh, almost one million uh, uh, tur uh, turkish muslims in bulgaria and uh, with the explosion of uh, 300,000 of them so uh, we should take into, into account uh, the fact that uh, the national national disc, nationalist discourses and in general this kind of ethnocentrism was quite present in the public space uh, in countries like Bulgaria already before the fall of the uh, communist regime or state socialism in uh, 1989. Uh, unfortunately, the so-called transition period didn't uh, didn't really uh, bring any solution to um, this um, situation. In this case, um, what we had um, in the 90s, especially as a, but what we had in the 90s, especially, was a um, different kind of antagonism. It was um, related. Uh, or political antagonism, which dominated the public space and which was not so much related to the question of the national history and, uh, and in general, the values of the nation, so to say. And this battle, which dominated them during the 90s in the case of the Bulgaria, was between two colors, uh, the uh, blue and red, so to say. So the main uh, uh, public, uh, well, political and public antagonism that really dominated in the public space was the one between uh, polit uh, well, political circles and public uh, figures, public um, 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 public uh, co commenters and um, you know, representatives who were related, considered to be related to the former regime, uh, the red ones, so to say, and uh, uh, the anti-communists, the new anti-communist parties, uh, intellectuals, um, intelligentsia as a whole, uh, the, so to say, the, the blue one. Uh, so uh, even if uh, during that period uh, there were no really the question of national history of um, nationalism were uh, and were not really so much debated in the public space, they were still present. And actually, the uh, what we can say is that the, these two colors, these two fractions in the Bulgarian society, the reds and the, the blues, had actually uh, different, um, exposed different forms of nationalism. Um, uh, the one of the, let's say, the former communists uh, was uh, still much insisting much more on the sovereignty of the Bulgarian state against the new kind of Western new infil infiltration and so on. There were also uh, political groupings uh, rather marginal in the beginning, which were trying also to, uh, uh, to in a way, to um, legitimize the anti-minority and nationalist policy of the former regime with regard to the Muslim population in the country and so on. On the other hand, there were uh, the new, uh, there was the new uh, anti-communist, so to say, articulation of nationalism, which was which attacked uh, the, uh, the the former communists on national grounds again, as uh, this time as national traitors, in particular in the field of the Macedonian question, 
uh, accusing the Bulgarian communists of um, uh, being especially active in the invention of Macedonian nation uh, and so on, uh, with uh, all, all the stories about uh, Dimitrov and the Comintern that you know quite well in the in North Macedonia as well. And um, so, uh, frankly, uh, was basically what we had uh, during the 90s was this antagonism between two uh, nationalistic interpretations that dominated in the in the public space, but still the main public interest was uh, elsewhere. It was not so much towards national history and the national questions. It was uh, rather either related to communism and Europe, the European future and so on. All that, uh, all that uh, in a way ended uh, with the beginning of the new century. And uh, there are some global uh, trends that can explain why this happened in Bulgaria in particular and in other countries. Uh, but um, also there are some uh, local, of, of course, local dynamics and uh, local particularities that should be also taken into account. Namely, in 2001, suddenly we had the new government, which was neither blue nor red. This time it, it was yellow. <laughs> and this was uh, the government of the former Tsar, uh, Simeon II, who uh, came to power with completely different kind of messages, not anti-communist, not pro-communist pro either. Uh, well, the first kind of populist government uh, in Bulgaria, so to say. Uh, but uh, in a way, uh, Simeon's rule was, uh, uh, Simeon's government in this case, was the end of this bipolar model of politics in Bulgaria, this bipolar um, character of the public debate between, uh, so to say, communists and anti-communists. Uh, so uh, uh, suddenly, the main uh, interest, public interest, uh, in, within the society, um, in a way, started to look for new, um, how to say, new topics. And in this new uh, kind of uh, new, new uh, con conjuncture, political conjuncture, nationalism suddenly became uh, suddenly, not really suddenly, but little by little, became much more important than it used to be in the night. So uh, in uh, 2005, we all also had the first uh, really important, the creation of the first really important extreme right nationalist party in Bulgaria. This was Ataka, which entered uh, the parliament uh, immediately. Uh, Ataka, well, of course, already before Ataka, we had some other nationalist parties, like, for instance, Vemereo, the Bulgarian version of Vemereo, and so on. But they were able to enter the mainstream politics thanks to coalitions, all kinds of coalitions, and that they were not really that important in the parliament. Ataka was a, was a new phenomenon, really, so to say, in the Bulgarian politics and public sphere, uh, and uh, which, in a way, uh, reminds of the uh, Romanian, Romania Mare, Greater Romania, which existed, existed uh, for many years before Ataka, and everybody was, was asking, but how come in Romania they had such kind of party, and in Bulgaria you do not have? Well, we finally uh, got one with Ataka. And uh, uh, 2005, uh, 2007, uh, this was in 2005, and 2007, uh, well, this is uh, the year when Bulgaria finally joined the European Union. So uh, really, uh, just like what, uh, what you emphasized, uh, indeed, in your question concerning this kind of new legitimacy, new popularity of nationalism, which is related paradoxically to the EU accession and EU membership, well, this is really what happened in Bulgaria. Because uh, not only with the creation of Ataka, but many other um, uh, things, uh, many other aspects could be evoked here. Already the, the, during the first year of our membership in the Euro European uh, Union in 2007, we got the first uh, really important mass hysteria on, on nationalist basis. And this was the so-called Batak, uh, Batak scandal, a scandal around a um, 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 scholarly project of uh, the, the eminent scholar Uf Brunbauer and the B Bulgarian art historian Martina Baleva, uh, which for reasons that are quite complex and really difficult to explain, provoked such a mass hysteria that um, I was, I personally, and I believe that nobody had witnessed in Bulgaria before uh, the EU <laughs> accession. Uh, um, uh, kind of uh, mass mobilizations similar to what happened in Greece around Karakasidou's work in the 90s or uh, to Maria Repussi's textbook uh, later. Um, and uh, this was a sudden, sur sudden surprise for the liberal elites in Bulgaria uh, as well. 
so, uh, so um, even if in, during the 90s as well, we had plenty of small public scandals of the kind, uh, well, um, uh, some kind of, go uh, well, uh, public uh, idea, public gossip, so to say, public um, uh, manipulations uh, in, um, uh, concerning, for instance, the uh, history textbooks. Uh, during the 90s, as already since the 90s, the Bulgarian society, there are regular scandals uh, concerning the historical textbooks because there are always uh, different groups in the Bulgarian society that uh, somehow imagine that the textbooks of history and also literature and other topics related to the national identity do not present a really uh, patriotic version of the national history in the way it should be. So even if during the 90s we had already such scandals concerning for instance, the idea that the Turkish yoke, the, ter the term Turkish yoke, will be um, uh, left uh, out of the two history textbooks and so on. Well, already this term didn't exist already during the late socialism, actually, uh, in the textbooks. But nevertheless, uh, much more important scandals, public scandals concerning national history, scandals of nationalist character, started after Batak. So Batak was but so-called Batak, scan Batak scandal in, in 2007. So until nowadays, we had have regularly, almost uh, every two months, some kind of public mobilization against a new textbook or something else. Uh, so, what is the explanation behind uh, all that? It is really, mm, mm, it is really a complex question, and I'm not sure that I can really address it here as it should, it merits to be uh, addressed. But certainly, uh, what uh, could be evoked and uh, certainly would be evoked by uh, left-wing intellectuals, this is the social economic cost of the transition. Uh, so, uh, uh, some, uh, an aspect which was emphasized by the speaker bef before me, um, uh, that this general disappointment of the public from the post-socialist social economic transformations. Uh, this kind of, uh, this uh, general disappointment suddenly, in my opinion, um, cut the link between citizens and states. Uh, state, Bulgarian state, Bulgarian, in the sense of Bulgarian government, uh, Bulgarian government, the Bulgarian um, authorities, uh, is not uh, legitimate in the eyes of broad, really broad circles, uh, broad layers of the Bulgarian society. We see it also today with uh, those mass protests that we have in, in Sofia and other cities. Uh, and this, even if this link between state and citizens was broken, um, well, uh, still, uh, in my opinion, there is a general need of some collective identification. And this, this time, this ident 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 identification is found in the nation, in the national history, in the national identity, national ideology. So national history is a kind of refuge um, uh, and uh, collective refuge, so to say. And um, the only form of collective form of solidarity that is still legitimate in the eyes of uh, the broader public. So uh, even if there are more and more people who do not vote, uh, for instance, do not go to the uh, to vote the elections, well, they strongly identify with Bulgaria in the sense of national history, nature, uh, natural beauty, and so on. Uh, so we have um, uh, this kind of popular saying, I, um, I hate the state, I love the nation. And this is, unfortunately, this is the, uh, this is really the, uh, the the, the qu quite popular actually quite popular attitude in the within the Bulgarian society nowadays. Uh, so uh, uh, what I would um, say is that it is it is easy to condemn nationalism, and nationalism is all, all often condemned in Bulgaria by uh, representatives of the liberal intelligentsia. But in unfortunately, uh, quite often they seem quite disinterested. Uh, in the social economic uh, mechanisms of this uh, new nationalism, new forms of nationalism, and the social economic reasons for the popularity of this uh, nationalism are poorly explained, in my opinion, at least in the Bulgarian case. Uh, for uh, well, uh, I would give, for instance, one example: this kind of sudden um, um, popularity of all kinds of local festivals, uh, traditions, uh, neo-traditionalism that we have in Bulgaria with all kinds of uh, invented traditions that are currently more and more popular in Bulgaria. There are plenty of liberal uh, scholars who always um, uh, describe these uh, new invented traditions 
and festivals in the country as a uh, as a kind of kitsch uh, that is uh, simply stupid and um, um, it is one uh, it is simply something that should be uh, in a way uh, simply condemned in a so to say civilized european country nowadays but for many local communities for instance this is the only way this kind of self self exotification is the only way to uh, uh, to get some kind of public interest also economic interest business interest uh, um, potentially some investment in the local economy and so on so there are plenty of plenty of um, reasons that could be uh, could um, should be actually emphasized behind these new forms of uh, nationalist um, uh, mobilizations and uh, inventions of traditions and uh, and so on in uh, in a country uh, as Bo as bulgaria and maybe uh, one uh, last uh, point uh, that I will actually maybe stress it in the next uh, round of yes. questions. It concerns, it concerns um, namely the question of revisionism. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Shavdar Dubrovka, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> and thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, well, uh, the, the question between uh, nationalism and misuses of history and the relation between Southeastern Europe and, and European Union, uh, I think that uh, uh, I can start with quite a cynical uh, approach by saying that somehow we in ex-Yugoslavia, that we were avant-garde, uh, the vanguard of that wave of populism that we are facing now, not only in Europe, but globally too. Because it started in Yugoslavia with the economic crisis. So again, this is, uh, I'm already the third speaker or even the fourth speaker speaking about the crisis, the economic, the social crisis that Yugoslavia faced in the early 80s after Tito's death. And that crisis uh, began, uh, was the beginning of that uh, a huge wave of historical revisionism. And I may say that it started in Serbia. It started with, with the questioning of Yugoslavia. It started with revisionism of the First World War, which made kind of a heroization of the nation. But quickly, it went back to the, to the Second World War because of especially the relations between Serbs and Croats. Because, of course, during the Second World War, there were mass atrocities between the two people, especially independent state of Croatia. So that, that situation, the, the, the genocide of the Serbs, as it's usually called, uh, started in mid-80s as a as an obsession, and it started the huge wave of self-victimization, which is, I think, crucial for each nationalism. So uh, the story went that Serbs are the greatest victims, that Serbs uh, cannot survive a new wave of genocide, for example, in the possible new war. So uh, the, 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 the ideology of the preventive uh, of the preventive war, the ideology of the new war, which, which was supposed to start in Yugoslavia in the 90s, and unfortunately it happened, uh, was the idea that history should not be replayed. So, so somehow in Yugoslavia, we already that, had that huge misuse of history, that huge wave of revisionism in order to create the new present and the new future. So history was used for the, for the creation of Yugoslav wars in the, 90, in the 1990s. And unfortunately, many of Serbian historians, but then, uh, but then it happened in the other nations, took part in that. So we can, I think that we can talk about the, the responsibility of historians for the not only for the wars of the 1990s, but for the huge and deep political crisis of our societies until today. Uh, so, well, the question is uh, that at that time, we, especially we, the Serbs, <laughs> if I may say so, we were the bad guys, we were the pariah of the world. We were under UN sanctions for years 
but somehow uh, it seems that nowadays it's quite fashionable, even even in the European Union. Uh, the, uh, the the Visegrad group was mentioned, but it's not only the Visegrad group. We, we also have Boris Johnson in Britain, not to talk about uh, Donald Trump and the ways he, mis he is misusing history in order to create the new American nationalism. So uh, I think that this situation nowadays is, uh, is very dangerous because it's strengthening somehow our local nationalisms. It, it gives some new power to our local actors. And um, I think that uh, the meeting in Blade in Slovenia uh, some two weeks ago was, uh, was very paradigmatic because uh, uh, our Slovenian colleagues and friends commented that before that meeting in Blade, that summit in Blade, was the place where American presidents or vice presidents used to come, or French or German or British prime ministers. But today, that was the meeting between the Visegrad group, Slovenian prime minister Janša, Serbian president Vučić. So it was a completely new framework where those populist European regimes are strengthening each other's, and I think it's extremely dangerous. Another thing which is very dangerous in the region of ex-Yugoslavia is that the wars of the 1990s are nowadays moved into the field of memory. So we started with the field with, within the field of memory. We started the disintegration of Yugoslavia within the field of memory in the 80s. Then we had wars. And from 2000 on, the, the wars are, are moved uh, into the field of memory again, as if they are waiting there for the new war, for the new conflict, which many of our political leaders are waiting, hopefully. So if we look uh, today's relations between today's nation states, for example, uh, Serbia and Croatia or Serbia and Kosovo, we see that all the emotions that we have in politics, and there are too many emotions in all of our politics, that all of those emotions, or almost all of those emotions, are created thanks to the interpretations of the past, and nowadays, mostly of the past of the 1990s. So now we had this, uh, uh, this very uh, interesting, I might say, or, or very strange contract signed in Washington between Kosovo and Serbia. And now we have huge emotions coming, uh, coming from there, or every year between Croatia and Serbia on some important dates, we have those waves of hatred between the two countries. So we can see how, how the conflict could be moved from, from the field of memory and misuses of his history in the real field, becoming even the genocide, as the, in the case of Srebrenica, and then back to the field of memory, and how those power games of our power, of our elites, are in fact uh, abled by uh, by those uh, misuses of and reinterpretations of history, and that's why I'm always calling for for for, for a rational uh, approach to history and uh, for 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 very for, for the rational approach to history. Thanks, Zupravka. Uh, so yes, that that was the first round of, of answers, practically one hour, 20 minutes. So uh, just to briefly explain it here, the idea of the panel session was to have three rounds of questions. Uh, the first one mapping some sort of diachrony and then moving on to the synchrony through the keyword of revisionism, which we understood uh, and practically uh, aimed at bringing uh, on the table as some sort of keywords which will be able to, to explain several processes which most of you mentioned, namely the various usage and misusages of, of history in the public discourse and the public space. Uh, and finally, the third round of question, which kind of concerns the prospects and, and the, the ways forward uh, 
but as I see right now, uh, I believe it will be the best to merge the, the, the next two questions into one. Uh, so practically to, to, to kindly ask you to refer to the notion of revisionism, uh, how you understand it and how you map the developments which are actually taking place at the moment. Uh, here we heard already that there are several, several stakeholders which are pushing for uh, different sorts of um, um, different sorts of interpretations of the national past, often using trans transnational platforms. Uh, and I would just, as a short, let's say here, sub question, maybe uh, push you to uh, discuss or even refer to the, the ways forward, the ways that the escape routes out of this, whether it's some sort of cosmopolitan memory, uh, you know, the third wave European kind of uh, model of reconciliation, or maybe something which was referred yesterday uh, as this notion of agonistic memory, the, the agonistic memory scholars, which are very much referring to MOVE's uh, model of, of uh, agonism, trying to actually uh, propose a model where uh, the various mnemonic actors in a given synchrony will actually reinvest emotions in, into their uh, into their uh, uh, narratives of, of history or particular historical events and figures. Uh, so if I may ask you as well to, to stick to five minutes per each panelist right now, so we will have some, some 15, I hope, to 12 to 20 minutes uh, for a discussion. And also one more brief technical uh, comment. I believe Michelle will not, uh, will give actually the floor uh, to, to Vyolta to kind of merge maybe the answer as they overlap to, to, to a certain extent. Uh, uh, so we can have some maybe uh, time to, to answer several other questions afterwards. So as we agreed, we are going again in, in re reverse alphabetical order. So Dubravka again, over to you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, yeah, the revisionism, absolutely, that, that's the key word. And we had a wonderful project for the last two weeks, also uh, two, two years, sorry, thanks to the European Union and to the Forum ZFD. Thank you, Forum, again, for, for this wonderful project. It was a regional project, the ex yugoslav project, if I may say so. It, it was called Who Started First? historians against revisionism uh, and well we had many uh, different activities with that within that project but the final activity was a declaration uh, written by historians from all over from Slovenia to, to Macedonia uh, Todorov our friend was with us all the time uh, and the, the title of the declaration is defend history so we do think that our discipline is endangered. And uh, we think that we should firstly uh, make a, a clear division between revisions of history, which are imminent to every science or to every scientific discipline. So revision is imminent to every science, but revisionism is the abuse of his history, intentional distortion of the past, due to the present political needs. So this uh, can be maybe a definition. And that declaration that, uh, that you can always uh, sign on the site called Crocodile, and I invite you to, to sign our declaration. Uh, so uh, the declaration starts with 10 points which can seem banal. So, the first point is history is a science. So are we now that deep in problems that we are obliged to say that history is a science? Yes, we think so, because it seems that everybody can say anything about history and that everybody became historians. So history is a science and you have to prove uh, uh, notions, historical notions that uh, that you are preparing to to become public, uh, or history is free in many of our countries. History and historians are not free, and this is also something that we are supposed to say. History is uh, transnational. History is um, is responsible. Things like this. And in the second part of our uh, declaration. 
uh, those are kind of recommendations to different addresses and I would like to, to name some of those addresses. For example, national assemblies, because it's very fashionable for the last 20 years for different, not only national assemblies, but also European parliament to, 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 to produce the so-called memory laws or declarations on history. And we think this is very, very, very problematic, very controversial and very dangerous because this is the way that uh, the, in which uh, the state authorities like parliament are uh, in fact giving themselves um, uh, giving themselves the, the 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 right to to write history then there are different local and state ministers uh, uh, which are giving names to the streets which are def uh, uh, deciding which holidays which national holidays will be celebrated uh, the name uh, which are changing the names of, uh, of elementary schools. So th this is that kind of public history, which becomes uh, an everyday history, which is all around us. And we also think that this is very irresponsible and this is also very, very dangerous. And we face it in all of our countries, not to speak about Macedonia, but also for example, Serbia. Now we have the new wave of, uh, of monuments, the new wave of, of national holidays. So, so you are the vanguard in that in this case, and we are uh, we are coming after you uh, with this new invention of of history. And then, of course, we are addressing ministers of education because, as somebody said before, history teaching is extremely extremely dangerous field. So you 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 are supposed to to push those young people in the way they're supposed to think not only about certain events, but uh, about a certain philosophy of history, which is usually very authoritarian and very monolithic. So there are many culpables. There are many those who are responsible for those misuses. And uh, uh, this is an important power game. So please leave our history, not only to historians, but to responsible people and let's defend history. Thank you. Thanks, Dubrovka. Chavdar, over to you. Thank, um, thank you, Now. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, this is also an important question, the revisionism in uh, historiography and the way it uh, influences the public field and the public discourses. Um, from this point of view, uh, yeah, I will maybe start again with um, the heritage of, of state socialism in Bulgaria, which is uh, somehow important. And uh, in order to also to show to what extent in some cases we can also, um, it is difficult to distinguish between simple revision, uh, professional revision of history, so to say, and this kind of bad revisionism as a kind of rehabilitation of uh, um, personalities, regimes, uh, and um, or, um, periods of the past uh, that uh, should be, in a way, presented in more critical way. Um, so, uh, already in the last uh, decades, uh, during the last decades of the socialist uh, uh, regime, uh, the national history in Bulgaria um, became quite, uh, quite nationalist and in many respects, from the so-called Thracian studies, Thracology, to the field of the contemporary history. So there are plenty of things to say here, and I'm not, go, not going to, into the details. Of course, uh, concerning the period of the contemporary history, the revision, for instance, um, in some more positive way of, for instance, the interwar period uh, regimes, the interwar period governments, and in particular, the period of the Second World War was quite difficult difficult bef before uh, 1989, simply because you can imagine that um, um, the, you can imagine the reasons for that. It was uh, simply uh, quite uh, challenging uh, for a historian to try to rethink uh, the, for instance, the character of the Bulgarian, most of the Bulgarian regimes during the 20s, the 30s and the Second World War in more positive, in a more positive way. Nevertheless, there were such uh, examples and something that was quite some, somehow important within the field of the historians was the so-called debate on fascism, debate on the Bulgarian fascism that started already in the late 60s. 
And uh, during this debate that lasted for more than two uh, decades, uh, actually many mainstream historians uh, tried to uh, criticize the general uh, cliche, which was in officially imposed, that all regimes in Bulgaria during the interwar period after Stambuliski's uh, agrarian rule were fascist. And of course, this is a sound, so to say, this is a legitimate, uh, legitimate, uh, absolutely legitimate activity, because uh, it is clear that uh, this wholesale uh, um, qualification of all governments in the almost all governments of the 20s and the 30s of the 20th century and during, and during the Second World War as fascist is somehow uh, problematic uh, for many reasons. Only that this process, um, this was really the beginning of a process which went too far. So already uh, in, the, in 1990, the main question which was debated not only among historians specialists of contemporary history, but one of the question which, questions which were, was debated in the Bulgarian public field, public sphere was, was there fascism in Bulgaria? So, one, so in this case, the problem was not the character of one or another government in the late uh, 20s or during the 30s, to what extent it was really fascist or bourgeois and um, traditional bourgeois conservative uh, bourgeois and so on. This time it was a question of a complete negation uh, of uh, denial of the existence of, um, of, of any problem with the uh, history of Bulgaria before uh, 1944. Uh, so in, uh, during the last decades before 1944. So in this case, as you can imagine, um, this kind of revisionism, which um, denied not only the existence of, existence of fascist organizations, fascist, uh, fascist governments and so on, uh, and in general fascist ideology in Bulgaria before, uh, uh, before 1940, um, yeah, before the uh, 1944, um, uh, this this was also uh, related to uh, this was related to the new anti-communist uh, nationalism, to the relative defeat finally of the so, so to say the red nationalism, which was uh, represented by circles related to the Bulgarian Socialist Party, and finally we can say that in Bulgaria uh, that uh, this uh, this kind of revisionism triumphed uh, already in the 90s. Until nowadays, this is really the mainstream, uh, how to say, the mainstream approach, not only within historiography, but also in the Bulgarian field, namely the idea, basically to simplify the things, that the, the idea that everything that is anti-communist is good, just like everything that is communist is bad, is supposed to be bad. And, uh, well, this is, of course, a simple, uh, clearly a simplification, but not not that not not uh, that um, serious simplification because uh, uh, something that uh, for instance one of the uh, one of the um, examples that I could give in the in the concer uh, which concerns the public field in particular is the so-called look of march uh, look of march it is uh, an annual event organized by neo-Nazi organizations in the center of Sofia. Uh, it has been, has, has been organized for more than, than 10 years. This year it was uh, banned by the authorities for the first time. And uh, it is interesting to see the public debates around this look of March and in particular who, uh, who opposed it, who was against it and who finally um, um, uh, was pretending that there was no serious problem with it. Uh, so the mo most of the organizations who were against this neo-Nazi uh, uh, parade uh, in uh, downtown Sofia were uh, NGOs, uh, in many cases foreign NGOs, Jewish organizations, foreign embassies. Uh, concerning, for instance, the liberal intelligentsia, so we are not talking about extreme nationalists here, we're talking about uh, mainstream liberal intelligence in Bulgaria. Well, its position was not so critical, actually. Uh, and uh, for different reasons, uh, namely uh, one of the reasons was uh, that, well, uh, Lukov, which is the personality around which this parade is articulated, Lukov was actually, uh, the, used to be the um, general Lukov, general of the Bulgarian army, the uh, leader of the so-called legions in Bulgaria, so a legioner, uh, legioner organization, similar to other fascist, fascist organizations in uh, in Europe, in Romania, uh, for instance. 
and a uh, person and an organization which was directly linked to the Nazi authorities in, in Germany and so on. Well, um, it was uh, in many, many cases, uh, while well, the public commenters, uh, sometimes with clearly liberal, otherwise liberal uh, point of view, was that, you know, okay, we should, uh, ex uh, history is never simple. There should be a, a free public debate. Uh, the questions are not that simple. And um, uh, finally, maybe yes, uh, we, can, we can, we do not know many things about Lukov, but finally, um, the problem is rather with the uh, concerning the event. There is also not necessarily a problem because there are young people of different um, with different political um, uh, ideologies participating there, and so on. So there were all, all kinds of uh, so to say um, um, defense uh, from uh, liberal anti-communist positions of this uh, of this event. And this is a really uh, a problem when we are talking about the, for instance, the, the mainstream media. This was uh, also this is also this kind of approach is also quite present, and it, in my opinion, um, uh, in a way, also uh, um, raises another question, and it is uh, the question of the limitations of the this kind of liberal idea of the free debate, because in many cases this free debate could be misused by people who try to make relative uh, many uh, problematic and uh, problematic things from the past, crimes of the past, uh, by stating that there are always two sides of history, there are always different interpretations, and we should take into account all possible interpretations and so on. This was done, uh, for, for instance, in the case of, uh, of this, um, yeah, in the case of this um, uh, look of March, and it is, in my opinion, one of, one of the uh, problems nowadays in countries like, uh, like Bulgaria. So, um, this revisionism should be stopped somewhere. Unfortunately, I cannot see how. And frankly speaking, concerning the ways out of this situation, it is uh, difficult for me to, to imagine these ways, at least for the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Chandler. Just as a brief teaser, we are having a text on the look of Marsh in the edit. We are actually planning a text on the look of Marsh in the edited volume. We are also trying to, the author, namely Philip Yapov, will also try to maybe map some of the transnational ties regarding this uh, right these commemorations as, as some sort of templates for uh, for revisionism so yeah this is a this is a pretty pretty good example in this regard without further ado I'll see, I'll see back back to you uh, your five minutes oh, um, the question of re revisionism the way how I see it is uh, it's based on three layers. And in a way or another, it's related precisely to the very concept of what revisionism is and it can be. So on one hand, uh, I see revisionism in the way how it is being played within Albania first as a political act, part of a certain agenda. And, uh, and, uh, and this is related with the question, who is asking for revisionism? And so on one hand, uh, coming to a very local scale, we see uh, uh, Professor Marinov uh, underlined the very same question of the reds and the blue in the case of Bulgaria and the reds and the blue in the case of Albania is very much similar, precisely in, in the way where political parties in Albania are, uh, especially in the field of communism, have been played their agenda in the sense of uh, how a certain political figure of the past uh, is being treated. So uh, precisely uh, this is a part of certain political agenda and a certain of uh, uh, where revisionism becomes a, a very relativistic perspective on one hand. So uh, certain key uh, figures that uh, during communism were downplayed uh, they came up and they were relooked and they were given certain positions in the uh, within the uh, the hierarchy of uh, Alba of the Albanian nation the one of the figures for example is uh, the case of king zog uh, of albania like uh, during communism his figure was very much uh, positioned at very low 
due to to his relationship with fascism on one hand and the way how he escaped left albania in the at the eve of uh, italian invasion and uh, the, the the communist uh, agenda eventually put him in a certain light uh, whereas uh, with the fall of communism uh, historians uh, backed up uh, related to the blue uh, started looking up uh, at the, his position and his contribution to the Albanian state. Eventually this kind of revisionism was entangled also with the position of the state during uh, uh, during uh, uh, the Nazi and fascist position where certain nationalistic figures uh, are uh, 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 they are being articulated by certain fractions of, of politics as uh, 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 they use fascism as an instrument to, 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 to unite the nation within one state for the logic of the greater Albania. And on the other hand, you have the red uh, politicians, uh, the, the, the red uh, historians that eventually would uh, underline precisely this, uh, uh, their collaboration with the fascists. So th this is uh, one position of, uh, of re uh, revisionism of, of political agenda that is very much localized within the, the, the gameplay between the political parties. On the other hand, uh, there is another aspect of the political agenda of a, a, a revisionism of Albanian national history as very much nationalistic that comes from different countries. Uh, where, uh, especially within the light of European Union, and here, uh, on one hand, uh, you, you have the question, especially uh, of the position, for example, of the minorities, how they are portrayed within the the, the political uh, within the history of the country, that would come sometimes from uh, Greek uh, commissioners. And on the other hand, you have this light of uh, neo-Ottomanism, for example, that would ask to, to, to portray the Ot Ottoman period within the Albanian textbooks in a different light, uh, rather than uh, see, uh, seeing them as occupier, but uh, eventually see the complexity of the Ottoman Empire as, uh, as a multicultural. And uh, so th this is one hand of revisionism. On the other hand, so this, uh, the, the agendas of revisionism would eventually uh, imply the positioning of different groups uh, of historians uh, and intellectuals into different trenches. On one hand, the trenches would go to emphasize a certain nationalism uh, on one hand, and on the other, you'd, you'd have the liberal uh, the historians that would, would give the different perspective of, uh, of, uh, of his history in the making. On the other hand, uh, the way how I see this complexity of the political agenda should be faced, on the other hand, with another perspective of revisionism. Uh, and here is uh, revisionism as an emancipatory act, revision as an act of eman uh, emancipation. And here goes the logic of values. Uh, so revision and values. If we have agreed to certain values, and that can be very much debated, probably the, uh, the, the logic of uh, a fair and just society and probably the, the, uh, the logic of human rights can be guiding uh, principle upon which uh, revisionism uh, of history in, in, in tackles a, a certain moment of emancipation. So uh, history as an act of justice, for example, where the injustice has been, uh, history for an act of, uh, of the weak, uh, history becomes a moment where the weak are given a certain justice within the big uh, framework. So this is another conception probably upon which uh, the value system of an open society, of a democratic society, of a society of justice and uh, uh, can be upon which the logic of history can be built. Yes, definitely history is a science, but we don't know really whether it uh, is an exact science because it, it enters within the humanities. But on the other hand, uh, yes, history is a political act and it's written by power relationships, but eventually probably the act of writing should be led by values. And this, uh, the, the, these are the principle upon which revisionism can work eventually as a principle and as a, and as a concept. Because on the other hand, uh, 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 the uh, relativistic uh, perspectives, 
if we have agreed that fascism, nationalism, uh, communism are evils, uh, to to a certain order, this can be event can be debated on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, should not be revitalized. And on the other hand, uh, another point which I should I want to uh, underline, uh, especially this concept of of of, of uh, revisionism as a political art often has led to symmetries, where symmetries have not been there especially in the moment where certain societies are, are, in, uh, are asymmetric in power relationships. And this eventually leads to misconceptions uh, of, uh, and uh, producing a certain type of history that is guided by power interests and political agendas. So this is uh, my perspective in the way how revisionism is articulated contemporary in Albania eventually, but not only. And eventually, how revision should be led by by values, uh, by values of freedom, values of uh, of uh, of human rights uh, concept upon which we have agreed, and against uh, the ideologies upon which uh, the 20th century has become a burden of, uh, on our society, either through nationalism, either through fascism, either through uh, communism. So this is my comment on it. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you very much. Uh, Yolta, over to you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Now, So uh, I would like to perhaps just think a little bit about the term revisionism and I would like to propose perhaps to, to call on the need for rewriting of history because here I align with uh, uh, feminist uh, notions and feminist uh, standpoints on, on history that if you look at the feminist movements, for example, regionally and globally, uh, you can, we can observe that there is no claim for singular uh, history. So what we need is plural histories, not a singular history. So I think the question is, is in this discussion about revisionism or rewriting is how do we open this space and this possibility and the public, how we enable a public, uh, public stage for uh, plural histories to, to emerge, to enter into a dialogue on what constitutes the past as a preconditions on how to look on that uh, at the future. So uh, therefore it is, but for, to, for this to take grant, it is important to take into the account the particular political, historical, intellectual and different discursive formations to gain a better understanding of the, of the past. And I think this, I see this as a, as a, uh, as a continuous uh, self-reflection, but also uh, posing questions about how and to, in what way the singular uh, histories have become also problems and have fed the nationalistic frameworks on how, uh, what's the, what constitutes the past, how the past ent is entangled in the present and what are the consequences for, and how the uh, uh, future is, uh, is uh, imagined. So for this, as the feminist claim or argue is that solidarity is, is needed, that there is um, solidarity across space, difference in pol politics, that deserves remembrance and recognition, not only for the sake of the memory of the past, but also for the future, where justice, difference, democratic uh, behavior, democrat democrat democratic um, practices, and human rights become, uh, become a norm. And I think here several of the panelists have pointed to the, the relevance of justice, to the relevance of the socio-economic and stru structural structural element into the uh, into the, um, the production of historical historical uh, narratives. Yes, and also to uh, so unless the, they, they they are not the norm, then also we uh, there there are always risks and uh, that uh, accompany any ideas or any attempts by different social groups, but also historians in uh, and. Uh, uh, and different political entrepreneurs to use and misuse history to to meet uh, any political interest in the in the in the present. So we in this this process of um, uh, I think it is important to recognize the re, the importance 
of rewriting history, but not only rewriting history, but also the importance of active, active uh, remembering. And I, I would like to say that perhaps panels like this, more of no, uh, knowledge production on, on history and how the history is, is, is produced and the social conditioning of the history through different, uh, through in education, through different formal and informal aspects of education, workshops, art projects, uh, is just one way of intervention in the history making. So because also this panel uh, is, this should contribute to this history making that is based on an understanding uh, of diff and who is within the historical narratives, who is not there, what, is, what are the omissions, what are the silences, but are also what are the possibilities for opening up uh, and um, allowing, um, single, uh, allowing plural histories to emerge through this, through this uh, production of history and looking at history as a social, uh, social, uh, social process. So the, um, the, uh, the re rewriting that opens up epistemological and historical questions also uh, in conjunction with how do we understand our fluid identities because identity is not as as fixed not even national identity is that uh, that fixed but it's fluid so how fluid identities that can be no, uh, global local transnational cosmopolitan and, and different uh, lived experience uh, memory and agency in the time of in the context of the present time but also in the past and in the uh, in the in the futures and for this the condition is this dialogue and communal com communal critical thinking to avoid any nostalgic and romantic renderings of the of the past and this is maybe to re to um, also to relate to the question about um, uh, the, the risk that nationalism entails because also uh, the renderings of the past in the nationalist, uh, nationalist uh, ideologies is always uh, nostalgic apart from being and romantic apart from being uh, ex exclusionary and, uh, and, uh, and uh, hierarchical. Uh, and of course, uh, maybe to add on this, the need for multiple, multiple stories, multiple, multiple histories, not singular histories, is also uh, a, as a methodology to move forward to res as a way to resist um, erasures of different voices uh, by hegemonic power whenever and wherever they tend to occur in our globalized uh, world, whether in the, not only in the local, our particular local local context, but also in the transnational and global global context. Because as, as a Kosovo uh, Albanian a scholar from, uh, from Kosovo, I can also testify lots of, um, of um, essentialized uh, representations about, for example, what a certain society in a certain region, especially from, from Southeastern Europe and broad, more broadly of the the Balkans. So it's um, uh, this, this, the idea is to open up, the, to open up the past for different readings and possibilities for rewriting, so that that rewriting also ends into a, that is based on the principle of, of uh, social justice, of uh, um, respect for difference, uh, because uh, yes, national identity is not a threat in, in itself, but nationalist sentiments and, and production of emotions that lead towards exclusion and also hierarchical renderings of who is within the imagined uh, we communities always poses, uh, poses uh, risk, entails risk for exclusion that can also feed into these uh, narratives, historical narratives that um, uh, focus on the unified body body politic, but unified body politics through very exclusionary lens and also hierarchical uh, hierarchical um, um, identifications and also constructions of the uh, different uh, different uh, different uh, identities. So that the rewriting of history that that um, opens up. Uh, not only for the sake of the memory of the past, so that we have to, that societies have to remember the past, but also of the imaginings of the, of the future, but that imagining of the future is where justice, uh, social justice, is uh, dominant, is corn the cornerstone, and respect for difference and human rights are the, are the norm. And I think for this uh, rewriting of history in this, in this way, and I think it's uh, not only important, but it's also 
are needed in order to to uh, um, to go beyond the nationalistic uh, frameworks and imaginings of the uh, of the future. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Kitsa. Over to you. Um, I found very interesting uh, the um, speech of uh, Dubravka um, about uh, revisionism in Yugoslavia as a preparation for the wars. And um, uh, I think it is very important, what uh, we also stress, the rethinking of history as a positive uh, kind notion of uh, revision of history. But revisionism is the negative phenomena, and rethinking is an um, important part of, um, of uh, reflecting about the uh, past and uh, report uh, important part of the cultural uh, and uh, collective memory. I don't want to, to, um, uh, to speak long about uh, uh, his historiographic revisionism. I'm not a historian. But I would like to, um, to, um, uh, to stress one, uh, one, one way, maybe, uh, which is uh, possible in, in this, um, in this uh, situation, in this landscape of uh, uh, strong national narratives in the region of, of former Yugoslavia, which are, like uh, Slot uh, Peter Slotelak said, uh, nearly auto-hypnotic. They are closed in their own cries and they, uh, they are not able to come in dialogue with another uh, narrative. And, and this is very paradox paradoxical because these are, um, uh, these are um, nations, uh, ethnic uh, uh, groups, they were living in one in the past in one uh, uh, federal state. And uh, we have, uh, in, on the uh, example of uh, former Yugoslavia and the narratives, uh, following narratives uh, on the um, uh, um, states uh, that, that, that are born after the collapse of Yugoslavia, uh, an example about the um, Balkan history itself. In Yugoslavia was not uh, um, reconciliated and overcome the, the memory of the two wars, of the First war, World War and the Second World War. But it was uh, through um, revisionism, historical revisionism was prepared the next, uh, the next uh, um, route of the, of the war. And now we have uh, one uh, problem uh, this is uh, the not overcome. This is, uh, this is in, in German verarbeitet, uh, not reflected uh, uh, war memory uh, from the two uh, great wars. And we have the new wars. For every um, every uh, republic, former republic, has new memory of the war. And this new memory of the war is um, uh, has the reason in the uh, not resolved memories in the two great wars uh, and to these two great uh, world wars uh, came in uh, in 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 the balkan uh, also the balkan wars the balkan wars uh, had um, where uh, nation building building and state building in the case of Albania. But many of these processes were um, not prolonged in, in uh, Yugoslavia, in former Yugoslavia, because in Yugoslavia was one uh, universal concept that uh, uh, self-determination of the nations, of the self-determination of ethnic groups is, um, is fulfilled in, in the federal state. And there was uh, 
von one side was uh, was uh, an, uh, an uh, atmosphere um, toward uh, self uh, programmatic of officially self uh, determination of the ethnic groups but there was uh, one taboo uh, this republicans cannot uh, it was uh, forbidden forbidden to um, my german and my english they are uh, um, always in dialogue uh, it was forbidden to um, to think about uh, national autonomy and in, in this i think this uh, overwhelming uh, narratives, these strong narratives uh, in in um, in the region of former Yugoslavia, um, are a result of many not uh, reflected and over overcome um, uh, cultural memories. I think uh, one way to 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 come out from this. Um, uh, ghettos of uh, national strong national narratives um, is transnational memory, uh, tra not as, as political or not as his historian uh, pro project, but as um, artistic and uh, literary project. Transnational memories are present in, in the literary, always, in all centuries. Um, transnational identity uh, characterized many great um, artists. Uh, for example, Kafka, he, in, in um, his biography, uh, he connect uh, many cultures, many um, states, and many traditions, the Jews, the, um, uh, the German tradition, and uh, the same uh, case is Beckett, uh, similar joys, but we have in, in our, in, in, in the Balkan, we have many, uh, many um, artists, they try to, uh, to create films uh, after the principle of transnational memory. Uh, one of them is Theo Angelopoulos. You, everybody from you uh, know uh, uh, his movie, Ulysses Case. The narration, narrative in this film is one, one creative transnational narrative. He goes from, comes from USA, goes from, from Greece, uh, searching after uh, three uh, not developed films of Milton Manaki, uh, searching through Albania, Serbia, Bulgaria, uh, Macedonia, and uh, coming uh, in Sarajevo. Sarajevo is a shifter for, for, for the um, great suffering under war in, in, in this, um, in the 20th century. I think uh, if in, in all these countries, much more uh, um, artists, um, writers, novelists would try to mobilize one uh, reflection uh, and one dialogue of narratives we in in i am novelist i i write in, in in german but mostly in macedonian but i don't know why what are writing albanian uh, writers uh, except except luan starova but i know him as a friend from the time i was working in 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 on the U university of skopje but all other uh, writers i don't know what are their, uh, their novels? They are, uh, they are parallel uh, worlds in, in the, um, in the um, literature, in, the, in, in art. The same is with, with Serbian and Serbian writers and, and Kosovo writers. Um, the same is with Macedonian, not Mas Macedonian writers and uh, uh, writers in, in Greece. My biography, is um, has a part uh, 
to the biography of my parents, I am connected with, with Greece, but I, there was no framework how to come as novelist in a dialogue with, uh, with Greece uh, because there was no communication. Now, with press agreement, it's much more uh, possible to, uh, instead of uh, uh, all the protests from the nationalistic groups in both countries, but um, I find uh, partners in Greece and uh, intellectuals to, to share my bio, uh, refugee biography um, experience with them. The same is with Luan Starova. I uh, share uh, my uh, biography as a child of refugees with his biography. He is refugee from, uh, uh, from Albania. And what is the possible uh, point to, to begin with a dialogical narratives? This is um, to share all stories about victims in the Balkans, in former, in the region of former uh, Yugoslavia, but uh, broader in uh, the region of West West um, uh, Balkan, uh, in 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 broader um, sense. The second. Uh, very important point is to, on the biographies of um, artists, to, to recognize then that we cannot, as a nation, cannot occupy persons from the past for our own, only our own um, narrative. I was looking, searching in Wikipedia about uh, the movie of, um, of uh, Angelopoulos and there was, um, uh, in, in English and German, there was uh, uh, one excerpt about, um, the, uh, about this movie and uh, Milton Manaki, the, the filmmaker um, for which um, uh, undeveloped films um, is searching the hero in uh, the film of uh, Angelopoulos is in, in, in this Wikipedia called the Greek um, filmmaker in Macedonian. He is the Macedonian filmmaker. But why it is not possible in the, in the uh, kind, one kind of multidirectional memory uh, after the theory of uh, Michael Rothberg, why is it not possible that in Greece he can, Manaki can call it Greek um, um, filmmaker, filmmaker in Macedonia, Macedonian filmmaker in Albania, maybe I don't know if Manaki is in Albania uh, uh, known and, and uh, in the, at that time, but he was living in Romania. He has a Romanian um, in uh, his biography, biography, he has a Romanian part of his life. So uh, one person connects so many nations um, on one um, universal human uh, level, which is uh, higher uh, than the narratives. They cannot, um, the historical narratives cannot give a face on the events because they, when they speak about trauma, they, they uh, count the, the, uh, the number of, of the fallen uh, and, and um, dead people of refugees, but there is no uh, behind of these uh, numbers, there is no uh, face, human face, there is no biography, there is no story. Uh, I think as a novelist and philosopher, it is very important that um, uh, initiative have to be made in all uh, countries um, to create one archive of the transnational and trans 
and multidirectional memory. Uh, we have one paradigm, uh, we have one model, this is Holocaust uh, memory. The Holocaust memory is transnational in the best way. Holocaust memory in the theory of uh, Michael Rothberg is one model for post-colonial memory and for slavery memory. So uh, we, I, I don't live in, in, in the Balkan, but I, I feel um, very, um, I feel that I belong to, to this tradition in, in this memory. Uh, there is no something like this in, in the Balkans. And this is Europe's value. Uh, all the countries are declarative for European values, but they don't want to fulfill them in, in the reality. And uh, European memory means um, empathy for the victims, uh, one, one awareness about uh, one fact of uh, uh, Balkan history, then in the Balkan history, many, in, in several uh, periods, many um, people and many ethnic groups were sometimes victims, sometimes perpetrators. So to, uh, in this chaos of suffering, trauma, victims, perpetrators, and strong narratives uh, is, in my opinion, only the art, only the, um, in first place, uh, the novelist, the literature, uh, possible to, to give a new, new gaze, new view, and uh, a revision of textbooks means for me uh, to enrich the textbooks the sterile um, facts of the historiography with human, with biographical stories, with narratives, they are alternative to this, um, to the facts that in the historiography were uh, documented. So this, this is my, my uh, my, uh, my uh, programmatic uh, point, uh, what can be done if uh, many um, artists and uh, writers are willing, willing to, uh, to engage in, in um, transnational and uh, multi-directional uh, memory. This is not known, this is uh, new uh, for uh, many um, artist in, in on the Balkan, but this uh, doesn't mean that it has to be so. Thanks, Kita, and it's good that you mentioned this and illustrated the point, actually, the third Thanks, Kita, sorry for, for this. Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's actually very good that you mentioned this kind of platform for uh, cooperation as cooperation is actually the third keyword which is already stressed in the in the in the title of the discussion and which unfortunately we didn't have uh, very much time to dwell upon uh, but nevertheless I also wanted to mention that uh, these two uh, panel discussions will serve as some sort of uh, uh, entry points for developing the, the research framework which will be further on used uh, 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 the edited volume and, and also uh, when uh, we'll be conducting the one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, finally, Georgios, over to you. Uh, and also just before you start, uh, uh, I urge all the, the participants, I mean the, the audience to, to ask questions. Uh, we are running late, uh, so we will probably have uh, an occasion to gather, let's say one set of questions. Uh, and then finalize uh, the debate. Over to you, Kyrgyz. Thank you. Well, it's always difficult if someone is the last person talking. Um, and I'd like to start by uh, pointing out uh, this um, issue of defining uh, historiographic um, revisionism. Well, the previous speakers touched uh, the subject um, 
in many different ways. I personally opt for a soft definition, which allows us to share some kind of common understanding of the term. So in other words, for the purpose of this discussion, I perceive a historical uh, revisionism as a Weberian ideal type. Uh, in other words, historical revisionism to me has to do with claims such as Auschwitz was a playground, Auschwitz was a, a kindergarten and there has never been anyone killed uh, there. Now, in the case of Greece, um, history, historiographic revisionism has been developing uh, gradually since the mid 1970s after the fall of the Greek uh, uh, junta. Uh, initially, it was an attempt of ultra-right uh, um, journalists uh, claiming that the Greek 1967-1974 regime never tortured or killed anyone. And uh, this attempt uh, had a very marginal uh, public presence uh, and it was certainly not discussed, it was certainly not present among academic historians in Greece. Now, however, during the last two decades, an important and well-established, uh, well-established in academic terms, movement of revisionism appeared uh, among historians and political scientists in Greece. I'm mentioning the political scientists because in a way they uh, provide uh, narrations about the very recent past, it, um, something that um, modern historians also claim to uh, work on. Now, this um, new uh, academic uh, movement of historical um, revisionism uh, focuses predominantly in the period of the Greek Civil War. It started as such and it continues as such. Um, of course, it, it raises questions regarding the uh, in, uh, post Second World War uh, politics in Greece, the relationships between the left and terrorism in Greece in the 70s and the 80s, the, 80, the 19th century Greek Revolution of Independence, but it's mainly its main focus is the Greek Civil War. Um, what is important to stress is that these uh, new historical approaches claim that they have nothing to do with historiographic revisionism. So they, they disclaim any kind of relationship. What they argue is that they challenge the leftist and the liberal establishment in Greek historiography. As they as they say, they, their aim is to highlight the crimes of the communists, uh, of the communist military forces during the Greek Civil War. And in a number of publications, um, edited volumes, monographs, and papers published, uh, most of them in English and some of them in Greek, this group of historians and political scientists attempts to provide new meanings to uh, well-discussed topics. Now, mind that this latest movement of historiographic revisionism has been widely supported by the media in Greece, uh, and it's very active in what we can call uh, public history. The reason, in my view, lies in an underlying perception um, regarding the left-wing and the liberal historians has been hostile uh, to the nation. Well, that is not exactly the case. There have been uh, many uh, influential liberal uh, Greek historians who attempted to focus on the Greek uh, nation and the nation building process, but certainly their uh, writings uh, were uh, certainly uh, were less heroic and more critical of those of conservative historians. Now, to put it simply, the, the legitimacy of a nation, although it was not directly addressed by the new wave of Greek historiographic revisionism, was one of the most important factors uh, contributing to their agenda. 
Now, let me take uh, things to the uh, next level. Uh, historiographic revisionism is a movement which in reality talks about the future and less about the past. This is well addressed by the previous um, uh, speakers. Uh, no, history is usually didactic. Historiographic revisionism is didactic to the extremes. Allow me an example. About a year ago, when the Conservative Party gained power in Greece, the new Minister of Education uh, made uh, a public declaration explaining that we don't need any more social history in our um, schools, in the textbooks. What we need is national history. This is this was a, um, uh, you know a declaration which was um, uh, you know well debated at that time, uh, and of course this has not only to do with history; um, it has also to do it had also to do with other subjects uh, taught to the Greek uh, pupils. Sociology, for example, was excluded by the subjects examined in the university entrance exam. Uh, and there was also another minister um, uh, which explained that the teaching of sociology uh, in Greek schools turns Greek teenagers into communists. Uh, now, this sounds as a joke, but it's, it's a part of reality. It is in this context that the only acceptable history is, of course, a, a history uh, glorifying the nation. Now, is there a way out? I love the example provided by uh, Professor uh, Kolbe, the example of the uh, Maniaki uh, brothers. Uh, because the Maniaki brothers lived in um, uh, what is today North Macedonia. Uh, they traveled around in the whole of the Balkans. But as we know, they were Vlach speakers. Uh, so they had all these relationships with Vlachs scattered around uh, in Romania, in Serbia, uh, in, uh, even in Turkey. So the discussion of whether or not there's a way out of uh, um, historical revisionism and uh, all this uh, stress to the ethnic um, model of the nation, uh, of course, it's not it's not something new, it's taking place since the 19th century. And it's difficult, it is certainly difficult to imagine what will be there after the nation. And certainly the nation will be with us, I mean, us homo sapiens uh, for at least some time. Now, given this, what we need are new paradigms for what it means to be Greek, Macedonian, Bulgarian, German, French, uh, uh, and you know, name it. This is, and it has always been a political process, defining ourselves. If we manage to materialize these new paradigms, the problem of historiographic revisionism, in my understanding, at least will be limited. So we need civic perceptions instead of ethnic ones, civic perceptions of the nation. Um, is it possible? Well, it is challenging, but it's not very difficult simply because even the most ethnic oriented nations have always had mechanisms of incorporating others. Sometimes silently, sometimes um, uh, in a gr grotesque manner or a grandiose manner, um, but quite effectively. Um, sometimes, of course, uh, and this incorporation uh, failed and we had uh, ethnic cleansing. The examples brought by uh, Professor Kolbe are quite clear. But allow me a, a kind of very grotesque example of how this incorporation turns um, sometimes uh, into something, into a, a, an urgent need for the nation. Um, a few days ago, the refugee camp of uh, Moria at the island of Mytilene was burned to the ground. Uh, more than 13,000 uh, refugees literally uh, have nowhere to stay these days. 
Now, I follow the news uh, at the Greek TV channel where uh, an ultra right wing activist explained that the Albanian immigrants, about half a million, who arrived in Greece in the 1990s were welcomed because they are like us and they cook the same food, they have the same jokes, etc. Now, I laughed because we all know that in the 1990s, the Albanians who arrived in Greece as migrants, they were not welcomed at all. But it is in this new context where you have all these uh, Afghani, the Syrians, and the Pakistanis, the Pak is coming, that the Albanian is becoming one of us. Okay? And it's becoming one of us, not for the uh, liberal politicians, but uh, for some ultra right wing uh, activists. Uh, so, oh, our nations are the result of layers upon layers of incorporation, exclusion, and ethnic cleansing. We need to expose these plural histories. We need to be hospitable to many histories. Now, some we think that this is difficult because everything is gloomy, you know, the failures of the European integration, the socioeconomic crisis, the refugee movements, the pandemic, etc., etc. But we have no alternative. We have no alternative other than discussing, communicating, building bridges between our people. Uh, and the past provides us with many examples. The past is in our favor, I would say. And it's not only the example of the Magnaki brothers. I'd like to bring a similar example. Uh, we all know this, uh, you know, movie uh, Zorba the Greek. Okay, it's based on a, a novel written by Kazantzakis. Um, uh, Zorba was a real person. It did exist. It lives. Uh, he lives in the late um, uh, 19th, uh, early 20th century, uh, and he died at Bitola, because that was the last place where he lived. He had a family at Bitola, one of his many families. I think he had six wives. He married six times in his life. So his last wife was someone who was living at Bitola. He's buried uh, at. Um, uh, a cemetery at Bitola. Uh, Zorbas, so you know, was a figure of, uh, you know, more than Greeks, uh, is the narration that we need. We need to uh, provide narrations claiming our multiple pasts as a gate of uh, if to our future. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Gergis. Uh, yes, it's copy. Uh, I believe this is what Kitsa wanted to, to suggest. Uh, so yes, he's, he, he, he's uh, practically buried at the cemetery of Skopje. Uh, yes, and thanks for, for your, your, uh, your, uh, your, your talk. Actually, it, was, it sounded even as a wrap up. Uh, so uh, I'm seeing that there is, no, there is no question in the comment box. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can give you a floor once again to anyone maybe who wants to, to add something to this discussion. Um, I actually myself wanted to, to raise as a very final topic the issue of cooperation, which actually Kitsa and Jurgis in the end touched upon. Uh, and I'm pretty satisfied how it went in the end. So uh, if there is no other uh, comments, we are running late for almost half an hour. Again, I would stress that we will use this, uh, this debate, uh, both today's and yesterday's one, to build up a framework which will be afterwards uh, used in, 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 the, in the interviewing processes and, and again, in, in the edited volume. Uh, I'm seeing that there, there is no hand, this virtual hand. Uh, so please allow me to thank you all again in this case. Uh, we will keep you updated with the project and uh, yes we will practically uh, uh, we will have the de debate online soon uh, and yes thanks again thank you bye 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 thank you thank you thank you it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. You have a great yeah. evening. Good yeah. night. Bye. Nice, have a Bye. nice weekend. Yeah. Do you do? Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye.